Welcome to English 430 and 560. These are the podcasts for Shakespeare's drama, produced by and starring Dr. Bill Dines. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it that's surfeiting The appetite may sicken and so die That strain again it had a dying fall Oh, it came o'er my ear like the sweet sound That breathes upon a bank of violence Stealing and giving odor And now no more Tis not so sweet now As it was before Enough No more Tis not so sweet now As it was before That's Canadian pop group Bare Naked Ladies Who set Orsino's opening lines to music For the 2005 production of As You Like It In Stratford, Ontario now, I've never been quite sure about why they chose music from a different play for that particular production, but clearly they didn't feel like they had to check with me first. At any rate, uh, I, the soundtrack for the performance is available for purchase at their official website, bnlmusic.com, and I highly recommend it. Starting with this clip reminds us of just how integral music is to Twelfth Night. In his introduction to the play for Bedford Books, editor Bruce Spith points out that, quote, in a theater without illusionistic scenery, Illyria is more a soundscape than a landscape, and music forms a prominent feature in the, within the play's acoustic horizons." End quote. The play begins and ends with music, and song is used throughout both to set the mood and to explore characterization. Both Viola and Festi are described as excellent singers, and the elegant chamber music of Orsino's court is balanced neatly by the boisterous carousing of Sir Toby and Sir Andrew. Notice that Festi is equally at home in both settings. Yet Orsino's opening lines aren't a simple acknowledgement of the power of music. That layer is there, of course, and notice the way he suggests that music opens up all of the senses, as the sound reminds him of lying on a bank of violets, seeing their beauty, smelling their aroma. Music, like theater, evokes and augments our emotions. But the monologue also suggests that too much of a good thing can be a little cloying, even painful. He's asking for an excess of music to drive out the love that he claims he's feeling. As Orsino and his buddies chatter on, it quickly becomes clear that Orsino is more interested in the appearance of love than in the emotion itself punning on the word heart, invoking the myths of Acteon and Cupid, then heading off to find a convenient bower within which to collapse. Orsino is posing here, isn't he? He's going through the motions of what an upper-class Renaissance lover should feel, should say, should do. Whether he's posing for the benefit of his buddies, for the audience, or for himself, I think that remains to be seen. Immediately then, the play introduces one of Shakespeare's favorite themes, that tension between what is artificial and what's natural. This, of course, is something that Shakespeare's been playing with all throughout his career. But a couple of recent changes in his working conditions help account for the fresh life that that theme really seems to acquire with this play. One is the move to the globe, which, as we've already seen in Henry V and Hamlet, appears to have invigorated the way Shakespeare thinks about that performative nature of identity that we've been talking about. Another is that loss of Will Kemp, the Lord Chamberlain men's principal comic actor. Replacing him with Robert Armin meant changing from the rowdy physical comedy of a character like Falstaff to a more witty verbal character like Festy the Fool. So as you read Festy in this play, it's worth thinking about the ways in which his comedy differs from that you've seen of Bottom and Falstaff. 
the tension between what's natural and what's artificial is introduced in a variety of ways in the play's first scenes. Here's a quick list that probably isn't complete. As we saw with Orsino, love is a natural emotion, but we express it in very artificial ways. It's easy to mock Orsino's affected manner in the first scene, and we should. But think about the highly ritualized processes by which we go through love and courtship in our own society. I think you'll be a bit more sympathetic. Is Orsino's habit of sending a new messenger uh, to Olivia really all that different from making that first phone call uh, to a girl that you've just met in class or trying to perf perfect that wonderful instant message to send uh, to that cute guy you just met. Olivia's grief is also both natural and artificial. She mourns her brother, but she's doing it in a thoughtfully crafted way. Walking, She'll walk around her chamber weeping once a day for seven years. Human communities in this play seem naturally to sort themselves out into hierarchies. Viola pays the captain for news of her brother. She becomes a servant to Duke Orsino. When Sir Toby claims that Sir Andrew, quote, hath all the good gifts of nature, end quote, Marie agrees that he is, quote, almost natural, but by that she means that he's a fool or an idiot. Is it nature that makes us who we are? or the additions of civilization. That tension is explored even more explicitly in the struggle between Sir Toby and Malvolio, one an embodiment of boundless life, the other a figure of care and order, one's natural, one's artificial. The most important element in this pattern is probably gender. Shakespeare had already written several plays featuring cross-dressing heroines and has explored the tension between same-sex and heterosexual love repeatedly. Twelfth Night, however, raises the stakes considerably by introducing a twin for the girl who's masquerading as a boy. Viola and Sebastian each find themselves in relationships with same-sex and opposite-sex partners. And in each case, resolving the complexities and involves at least as much discovery about the self as it does revelations to others. Since this is supposed to be just an introduction, I don't want to give too much away here, so I'll confine myself just to a few more broad generalities. Let me draw your, me draw your attention to, tightly organized to the tightly organized emotional arc as Viola finds herself in Illyria and decides to serve Orsino. The rapidly shifting hopes and fears and calculations provide a valuable prelude to the play as a whole. Viola's first thought when she hears about Orsino is that, quote, he's a bachelor, end quote. Hearing that Olivia is mourning her dead brother, Viola wishes that she served that lady, obviously recognizing the parallels between Olivia's situation and her own. But when she's told that Olivia is allowing no kind of suit, and remember that we've been hearing about that word suit in the context of romantic love. Viola decides to serve Orsino in the disguise of a eunuch. Now Shakespeare's audiences might have been familiar with the story of Far Eastern eunuchs guarding, guarding their harems, but that narrative of Eastern indulgence really became popular in Europe well after Shakespeare's day. As Viola makes clear here, she's thinking in terms of the boys' singers who were castrated in order to preserve their beautiful singing voices. The chief connection here, of course, is with the themes of music and art raised at the outset of the play. Notice the hint that Olivia and, I'm sorry, notice the hint that Orsino and Viola are a good match since both are thinking independently along the same lines. But not far beneath the surface of these lines is the idea of gender as something that can be artificially controlled or manipulated. And more troubling still is the idea that that manipulation can be done for financial gain or at the command of powerful men. In 1599, castrati were first introduced as an official part of the Pope's personal choir. When Orsino admired Cesario's small pipe in Act 1, Scene 4, he may be close to recognizing the new, his new page as a woman, but he's certainly admiring the boy's uh, vocal abilities. The body pun is there for you to giggle at, too, if you want to. In this brief span of 30 or 40 lines, 
in Act I, Scene 2. Gender is implicated in contexts of both familial and erotic love, music, and service. Keep an eye on each of these elements as you make your way through the play. The brief scenes between Orsino and the cross-dressed Viola are recapitulated by the encounters between Cesario and Olivia, and parallel the strong feelings that the sea captain Antonio has for Viola's brother Sebastian, whom we meet in Act Two. As you explore the play, then, one of the elements to consider is how desire is experienced and enacted within these various couples. Are these characters attracted to features, both physical and emotional, in others that reflect or that complement their own? In other words, are they drawn to the security of something familiar, which in Shakespeare's day would probably imply stagnation, being trapped, unchanging? Or are they drawn to something that's new, different, other, which might imply fresh growth, new life? 